Good evening. It's my pleasure to call to order this February 8th, 2024 Curriculum and Pupil Services Committee meeting of the School District of Haverford Township. We will begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to, to the, the flag, flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And thank everyone for their patience as we uh, had a, a longer than scheduled finance and facilities committee meeting, but we're ready to get into tonight's uh, topics and I'll turn it over to, oh, Dr. Rushi to be written. Thank you. Um, before we begin this evening, I uh, just want to let our neighbors and in some instances, colleagues uh, in East Lansdowne know that uh, they are in our hearts and in our thoughts uh, the firefighters, police officers, any family who is now processing the loss uh, of a loved one, uh, that they are uh, on our minds this evening. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> and then Ms. Saxa will walk us through tonight's agenda. Hey, uh, I think we're, oh, is this on? All right. We're going to give finance and facilities a run for their money because we also have a very uh, full agenda this evening. Two items uh, on the list. First, our growth and local data uh, presentation, and then just a discussion. We'd like to continue a discussion about homework and share some thoughts where we are currently uh, with the board and the public and, and get some uh, input regarding that. Uh, but we're going to start with our uh, PVAS overview and elementary map growth presentation. I would like to thank you. You may see sort of if you were in the room, you'd see a a room full of uh, folks who are not only members of the community, but also people who work here. So I just wanted to thank my colleagues and the administrators, as well as uh, some of our curriculum supervisors. Thank you. Uh, we have interventionists here to present this evening, uh, Barry Butler, Kim Bohr. We have math coaches, Susie Kinsley, Lauren Schaefer. We have reading specialists, Aaron Duffy and Amy Hummel, who, by the way, are coming off of a very successful literacy night at Linwood, 600 people attended the carnival uh, themed L Linwood Literacy Night. Unbelievable. So, uh, you know, I know that's a labor of love for Mrs. McGillivray and, and the whole team over there, especially you as reading specialists. So thank you for that. Um, so welcome to all of them. Thank you to the board for this opportunity. Uh, let's see. Just anytime we have a presentation about data, we like to center ourselves on our mission and goals. And just a reminder to the public and the, and the folks in the room that um, you know all of our work really is, is seated in our strategic plan. And that strategic plan was uh, crafted with the input of many uh, over a course of, of time in 2019. Um, you can see all of the input that was sought there was a representative planning committee with representation from all sorts of stakeholders um, who uh, followed an established process of looking at the research, looking at the data that was collected, the input, and establishing some goal areas and statements, ensuring that they align with our mission and pillars. Uh, and so that is why at the beginning of every board meeting, you hear these particular goals and these particular uh, mission and, and pillars. And so we want to just remind everybody about that as we began. Um, you, you know, we don't only measure our students in the ways that they achieve and grow academically. Of course, we also have non-academic achievements and performances that we monitor. Um, and you can see a list of the many ways that we do that here. Uh, tonight, however, is about some of the academics. Uh, we're going to be focusing on PVOS growth, what's called MAP assessment data, which we'll explain in a little bit, and Ames Web growth and achievement data. At future meetings, we will report out on some of those items you see on the right-hand column there, such as the PSSM and the MySaver screening. Uh, before we get started on the actual growth data, which we have a lot of to share with you this evening, I did want to uh, just share this little celebration you may have seen in the Haverford Happenings. We didn't have this information when we reported the achievement uh, data back in, I think it was November, um, but now we do. And so we're able to see that when you look at our PSSA and Keystone scores, um, as you see listed here, and you look at the total number of what's called local education agencies, or that's sort of all the charters and all the districts that offer that test, you can see what percentage we ranked when it comes to achievement. So this is not growth, this is straight up, did we have what percentage proficient did we have and advanced. And so for math, we are in the top, five, or in grade, across grades four through eight, top 5% in the state, 
and ELA in, across grades four through eight were in the top 3%. Science were in the top 9% uh, in grade four and the top 4% in grade eight. And then for our keystones, we are um, in the algebra keystone, the top 2% of the state for achievement. Biology, the top 1% of the state for achievement. And our literature keystone, the top 4% of the state. So we just want to congratulate our teachers. You know, we, we have grades 4 through 12 represented there, but that is reflective of all of our teachers, K through 12, uh, all subjects and, and sort of the uh, environment that they create, the foundation that they give our children. So we wanted to just uh, have a little shout out for folks for that celebration. Uh, but we're going to also talk about PVAS. So Christina Carter is going to talk to us about what is PVAS as well as our results. Hi, good evening. So oh, this is a little bit close for me. So in the fall, well, end of 2023, we obviously talked about what our achievement was. So now I'm going to break down what PVAS is. If you, if you need me to pause, please just let me know because it is a lot of information and we don't want you to get the glaze over your eye when we start talking about data. So when you hear the acronym PVAS, you want to think about student growth and measuring the impact of instruction. PVAS previously needed three years to be able to calculate growth, but due to the pandemic, they found a way to calculate growth without three consecutive years. After this school year, we will have PVAS growth data for three consecutive years again. So we'll go back to the normal pattern. PVAS provides growth reports for educators to analyze growth over time across grades and subject. It also uses all available data on students to do two things. It measures where groups of students perform in relation to other groups of students in the state, which we'll see shortly. And it predicts or projects at what level students will perform on future assessments, which our teachers use quite often. PVAS scores reflect whether there is significant evidence that a group of students made the expected growth. You'll hear me using those terms tonight, expected, exceeded, moderate. So you start getting used to that in a minute. And scores also compare a specific grade level and subject each year. As leaders and educators navigate through the PVAS website, um, the data that they're reviewing, they're looking at student performance each year and they are able to track a cohort of performance over time if they need to. Our district leaders just recently, um, right before we went on break, went through training with our PVAS consultants, taking time to really learn about the new reports and information that the state has made available to us. They took their time, they were very thoughtful in what they went through, and you'll hear a little bit tonight about their understanding of things as well. Next slide. All right, so to the graph, so we go. So this is where if you need me to stop or clarify anything, please let me know. Here you are looking at growth compared by subject and district. First, we will look at the ELA information across Delaware County. On the screen, I have labeled Haverford. Um, the other shapes and colors can be identified on the side of the chart, which are other districts in the Delaware County area. Across the horizontal line at the bottom is your growth and or the x-axis and across the vertical line is where you'll see achievement. From this chart, we would say that Haverford is showing above average achievement, but did not meet the growth standard as set by PDE. But it is important for us to put that into context, which you heard a little bit before um, in the fall, so we'll give some now. So when you look at this information on the screen where you see Haverford, students in sixth and seventh grade actually show well above growth. Scoring a growth index, as they would say, of 3.11 and 4.44. Scoring well above the growth standard set by the state, which is excellent. So a large number of our students did well at the middle school. The state splits our students into five groups, which they'll say that they're in either group one up to group five. Group four and five are typically your higher achieving students and students identified as being gifted. We learned that students in these groups, which, which hold a larger number of our students in those top groups, are showing a range of moderate to well above meeting growth. We also know that these groups are the hardest to show growth with, and we'll continue to do work with them to make sure that they can meet their growth. And I'm sorry, I made a mistake, like they're showing, um, they're not necessarily meeting their growth just yet, but we're working with them to meet the growth. 
Our curriculum team and principals have also have already started reaching out to districts with high achieving, um, high achievement and growth to learn what they're doing instructionally that we can glean from. So far, we have Garnet Valley, which you see in the orange, which is hard to see on the screen, so you might have to look on your computer, but it's the orange square all the way to the far right. Um, and our curriculum team is, re oh, thank you. Who's, it? Who's doing that? Thank you so much. Is it you, Jim? Did you pull it up? Okay. Um, and our team is definitely reaching out to just learn what we can do in Haverford that they might be doing in the process. If you can go to the next slide for me, thank you. You are looking at the same type of graph now, but for math. Again, Haverford is labeled for easy identification. You can see that we met the growth standards set by PDE across fourth through eighth and are above average in achievement again for math. I will provide you context again. Grades six and eight exceeded the growth standards while seventh met the standard. So you have met, moderate, exceeded. And that information um, in a future side, you'll be able to see kind of the difference in that language. Grades four and five were well below the growth standard set. So that's an area where we're gonna to continue to work. As a reminder, our students, again, were divided into those five groups. Um, we learned that we need to continue to work with our economically disadvantaged students and our highest achieving students to help them to demonstrate growth academically as what this state has expected them to meet. The black square to the top right of the screen is Ratner School District, as well as the orange square, which is Garnet Valley again. And our team is going to be reaching out or, or has already been doing so to learn, see what we can learn from them as well. All right, thank you. Again, same graph but you're looking this time at fourth grade science. So I have to explain a little bit about science because you only have a science um, PSSA in fourth and eighth grade. So when you think about how they're figuring out their growth, the state really calls it a predictive methodology that they use for estimating growth in these subjects. Um, they use all the prior test data to be able to identify how a student or how they predict a student will do for growth. So for fourth grade, there was no other science assessment when you think about it. So they had to use their ELA and math assessment to figure out the growth. So to summarize these tests, previously taken by students are used to predict and set the growth. But when we think about fourth grade, we're seeing that they did not meet the growth expectations set. After reviewing the data of the students broken into the five groups, we know that on average, our students in group three, which is that middle group, and the high achieving students in group five did not demonstrate the growth, while other students did meet the growth expectations. So we had a mixture for our two groups. Now for eighth grade, science, same type of scatter plot, but look at where Haverford is. So the predictive measures, you, you kind of ask some questions at times because if they didn't meet it in fourth, but they met it in eighth, you would think like, how does that work? So those are some questions that we always still ask the state, but we're pleased to show you that um, in average achievement, we're well above what the expected growth is for our eighth grade students. So on this slide, we talked previously about our subgroups um, when we came and talked about achievement data. So we wanted to come back and re-talk about it for growth because you'll see some differences and you may remember some groups from before, but we always like to celebrate and highlight our groups. So let's do a little bit of celebrating first. Well, actually, let me orient you to the slide before I even do that. So on the side, you will see that there are all the assessments, right on your right hand side, thank you, are the assessments. Those are the bars you see across the graphs. Along the bottom are our subgroups, and the numbers you see along the left hand side, those are the numbers that they use to, for us to be able to determine their growth. So you, there's the language where you see me saying moderate, um, evidence, met, exceeded, and so on. So on the biology and literature keystone, all groups met 
to actually significantly exceeded growth. So we're really excited about what's happening at the high school and they just have to continue to do the great work that they're doing. On the eighth grade science PSSA, all groups met to exceeded growth as well. So great job for our eighth grade team as well um, in our science department there. On the PSSA, our students with IEPs and English language learners met or made moderate growth. So that's excellent news as well. Our African American and Asian students also met or moderately exceeded growth. So that's excellent news because we heard the opposite when we were in um, talking about achievement. So we want to celebrate the growth that we're seeing here today. Now let's look at some areas that we can continue to grow. Our economically disadvantaged students who I mentioned before um, showed moderate evidence of growth and did not meet the growth expectations set by the state. Our gifted students moderately showed evidence of not meeting growth on math and ELA for the ELA PSSA. Our white students showed significant evidence of not meeting the growth standard on the PSSAs as well. Our students with IEPs show moderate evidence or of not meeting growth on the literature keystone. So that's just an area for the high school that we'll continue to work on. I know Mrs. Bandestelli and her team really do a lot of work with our students, so I'm sure they're continuing to do that. We know that all of our students have the ability to make growth individually and to succeed. So we're going to just continue focusing on what we can do to close the gap for the students who need it. But we always like to honor the work that our teachers are doing with our students to help them close those gaps. Because that's some of those moments where you see teachers smile when they see those scores come in. And they're like, yes, you made it. I saw the close in that gap. And we'll talk about it a little bit later on this evening where they're using the MAP test to even and drill down a little bit farther. So I will pass it back over to Ms. Hexa. Thank you, Christina. Uh, and so this is just, Christina already mentioned some of these highlights, but I'll, I'll just go through a couple of them. Um, Keystones, um, again, this is high school. You take this at the end of a course. Um, we have shown growth over the last five years. Um, we've been well above growth uh, for all tests over the last five years with one that was just above instead of well above, and another that was meets one year. And that's in one test one year. So our high school has really shown a history of really strong growth and meeting those predicted and projected um, uh, levels of growth. Our middle school was uh, for 2023 was well above uh, for six out of eight potential areas, uh, which we think is a celebration for, for those uh, uh, folks and for those students. Our district students with IEPs met or exceeded their expected growth in all PSSAs, Algebra 1, and Bio Keystones. Um, and then our district Black and Hispanic students met or exceeded growth uh, in 12 out of 13 possible areas. Um, so those are some really uh, the positives that we like to celebrate. You know, of course, there are always the focus areas. So as Christina mentioned, it did... It didn't come as a surprise to us, unfortunately, but uh, we are really focusing on grade four for growth when it comes to math and ELA and also grade five, because those are the two grades where we are not seeing the growth we would like to see. Um, we even in our um, elementary schools, you'll find almost all of the teachers have a goal of growth uh, measured by MAP, but a goal, the goal is ultimately for growth on the, on the PVAS uh, in fourth grade for ELA and for math. Building principals have this as a goal this year. We are really trying to focus. And we're going to see some what we think is pretty positive data about what's happening right now when it comes to that. Uh, and we hope that that comes to fruition in PVAS and PSSAs. You know me, I like to point out a nuance. So I'm just gonna point out a nuance here. Like as we're looking at some of these things, we, um, we sat with the people at, from PVAS who were training us and we pointed out several, not all by any means, but several cases where students um, did not meet their expected growth. They showed negative growth and they were, went from advanced on last year's PSSA to advanced on this year's PSSA. And some of them even went from the 99th percentile to the 99th percentile, and they were still negative growth. Now, that is the exception. That is not the rule. We did also have students who went from advanced to proficient. Uh, we did have students go from 93rd percentile to 87th percentile, by all means, of course. I just always like to point out that, you know, anytime you're looking at numbers, 
they're made up of like children, right? These are these are children who are getting represented, and and this does not mean that you know on on a large scale every single advanced child isn't making advances as they're learning. It means that's how it sometimes shows up in the numbers, right? Um, but that doesn't mean we're not paying attention and that we're not addressing those things. I just always like to point out those little pieces. Um, so we are working uh, with our gifted individualized education program. You know, we're looking at that program development now, and we will continue to really focus on grades four and five for ELA and math. It's really an area where we're going to figure this out. We're going to figure it out, and we're going to make it happen. Uh, okay, I have the clicker. All right, uh, so uh, Dr. Nesbitt was unfortunately unable to be here this evening, but he did have time where he was able to create a video. He's gonna introduce us to, uh, reintroduce for some of us, and introduce us to what's called the MAP assessment, uh, and then uh, go over a little bit of our district-wide math data. So if we can get that video to play, we'll get to hear from Dr. Nesbitt. Now we're gonna talk about the NWA MAP growth test that we give to students in grades one through five. Uh, this is a test that we give three times a year. Uh, we give it in the fall, in the winter, and in the spring. And we give this to see how we're doing mid-year uh, in terms of the student's actual growth in learning both math and reading. Uh, we've talked about MAP before, but as a reminder, it is a uh, it's a test that's given it that is extremely accurate. Um, students are asked about 50 questions during the time, and the goal of MAP is that students get about 50% of them correct. It's accurate because it gives the students more challenging questions until they get it wrong, and then gives them easier questions until they get it right. And it constantly adjusts the level of questioning for the student that compares the student to other students like them. Um, MAP is extremely accurate in that we have to tell uh, the system how many weeks of instruction the students have received, and it compares those students to other students in a similar grade um, with the same amount of instruction. The nice thing about MAP is, it, MAP is it is grade independent, which just means it doesn't matter what grade the student is in, they can um, get questions that are, if they're in second grade, at the second grade level. They may get questions at the first grade level or they may get questions at the third grade level. Um, it is measured in something called a RIT score. Uh, generally speaking, students in grade one have a lower RIT score and students in grade five have a higher RIT score. Um, a RIT is just a psychometric uh, term that basically gives equal intervals between each. Uh, you do expect that first graders grow more than fifth graders on the RIT scale. Um, and the next slide is a demonstration of what we look at. So uh, one of the things that we look at is where those students are relative to other students. And this is just an example. Uh, this actually has uh, middle school students on it, but you can see how uh, a RIT score can put someone right in the middle of that band The things that we look at is where those students are relative to other students and this is just an example uh, this actually has uh, middle school students on it but you can see how uh, a RIT score can put someone right in the middle of that band while they're working on that, I'll just say, um, you know, you're looking sort of at that green circle there and there are certain, the, that represents the RIT band. And so there are students who are at slightly higher levels or students who are just approaching or solidly on there. It's just a band. Uh, it's used to um, help give us some direction uh, with how to instruct students and also to be able to help compare students from year to year. It's an example. Uh, this actually has uh, middle school students on it, but you can see how uh, a RIT score can put someone right in the middle of that band or somewhere close to the next grade or maybe just not quite at the grade level, but they're constantly um, adjusting where they are on the scale. This is an example of looking at the student's actual growth. Um, and what this chart is showing us is that in first grade, um, our students are in the blue and on average, our first grade students from the first test given in September to the test that was just recently given in January, on average, first graders grew 10 points. 
the diamonds are what the 50th percentile, what the recommended growth is for that grade. Um, if the diamond is right at the blue line, this one's slightly lower, so we slightly exceeded the growth. Here we might have slightly exceeded the growth. Here we actually pretty significantly exceeded the expected growth. Here again, we exceeded the expected growth. And lastly, in fifth grade, again, we exceeded the expected growth. If this diamond were outside of this, then that would mean that the expected growth was higher than our actual observed growth. Um, so as a district, this time around, um, we actually met the growth standard. Uh, this was not the case last year at this time. Um, and this really is the second slash third year that we are, it is the third year we're using in this in, in math, but it is the second year we're using it as a district. And it's the first that we're really becoming comfortable with reading the reports and understanding all the details. This last uh, chart is just showing the achievement level of our students. And again, in every building, uh, this is compared to a national norm, what percentile we're at and the percentage of students in each subgroup. This is students in the 80 to 100 subgroup, 80th percentile to 100th percentile. So we have 41 percentage of our students way at the top. And on average, uh, the building is in the 75th percentile. And again, all of these you can see are extremely high um, and show that um, our students are doing well on a, an objective measurement of math. That's all. Thank you. So that's all for math, but uh, we will have uh, Mrs. Connolly is going to take us through the, uh, who is our K-12 humanities supervisor. I'm like, why isn't the thing? Yeah, it's me. Uh, is going to take us through the reading data. Sure. So um, Dr. Nesbitt did a great job explaining what this graph um, demonstrates and shows. And you can see where the expected growth is for language arts is that diamond. We call this a candle because we've, well, before I'll tell you what, those, those diamonds were above the candle, and so it looked like a candle to us. But now that we're achieving and our growth is actually higher than the expected growth, it doesn't look as much like a candle anymore. Um, so we're really excited to see that we have beat, as a district, the expected growth in first, second, third, and fifth grade, and fourth, we have even a little bit. Um, we're sort of right on where we should be for fourth grade. This is definitely not the way it looked last year. This is our second year taking um, the English language arts um, test for MAP. And so we're excited uh, to be able to share that growth with you. And we hope we continue to grow um, for the winter. Um, here you can see the median uh, score on the left uh, for achievement at all grade levels are green. We have high achievement as demonstrated by the percentage of students in the green and the blue. So uh, we have a good percentage of students in both those areas. The students in the red are generally students who've been identified and in need of specially designed instruction. And those in the orange are students who for reading are identified for additional reading support from our reading specialists. Uh, those in the yellow are given additional support in MTSS from our interventionists and classroom teachers. And we're gonna have Barry Butler dig into this a little bit to um, explain the process of looking at the data and grouping students. So we'll let, I think Barry's next. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, so after our students take the MAP test and the MAP window closes, we start to look at all of the data and we like to put it all into a spreadsheet so that we're able to look at the instructional areas, um, PSSA scores, um, this happens to be a fifth grade data sheet from Manoa. We removed names and student IDs, um, but you can see that we're looking at their third grade PSSA scores, their fourth grade PSSA scores. So we can really get a good picture of who these students are and how we can help them the most through MTSS and classroom instruction. Um, we also look at the instructional areas and how students have grown in those instructional areas. So for example, in fifth grade, they're really focusing on numbers and operations in the fall. So we're looking to see, are the students growing in that area in the fall? And if they are, where do we wanna target our instruction um, moving ahead into the winter and the spring? And I'm gonna hand it over to Susie. 
so once that spreadsheet is done and um, for each building and then down to the classroom level, um, the Lauren and I, the coaches, we will then help teachers focus in on their particular MTSS group. So what you're looking at here is a report that we like to use. Um, it's a class breakdown and it uh, breaks the students' RIT scores out by the four domains that they are tested on and you can really get a sense of where their greatest needs are simply by looking at it. We tend to um, prioritize numbers in base 10 and as Barry said, that's what we worked on in the fall. So then we're looking, did they grow? And where are they relative to the mean? So this is first grade data. And you can see, and I'm not sure if you can see the number, but the winter mean for first grade, I think is 170. Does that say 170? Yeah. Can't see it. Um, plus or minus about 12 and a half. So um, when you look at those, uh, just looking, say, at the top um, row up there for numbers in base 10, you can see in the classroom that's on the left, most of the students fall around that mean. Um, some of them a little bit below, some of them a little bit above, but given the standard deviation of about 12 and a half, they are right there at the average where they should be. You're going to approach that classroom and the resources that you use differently than you would the class that you're seeing on the right. The class on the right, you can see where that yellow mean line is, and you can see this is a very high achieving group of children. They're well above the mean in every area, not just in numbers in base 10. So we will dig down with teachers to this level so they can see where the needs are. They can see where their outliers are in those other domains that they might be addressing. So from here then, we choose the resources that we're going to use in order to meet them. And Lauren's gonna talk about that. So once we've really identified um, really where our students are falling in regards to the norm, we then need to decide, okay, well, how are we going to target their instruction and what kind of differentiation in terms of the resources and small group work do we need to bring into the classroom for each of those individual students? So uh, in our pacing guides, which we provide pacing guides for all of the teachers that really kind of bring all of our curriculum resources together so that they can open up and say, okay, here's a general idea of what lessons we need to be on, but more importantly, here are all the resources I can use to make sure that we're really meeting the objectives uh, with each of our students as best we can. So at the beginning of each of the pacing guides, um, there's gonna be a slide just like this with the suggested resources to use during MTSS or really any extra time that they have during their regular instruction. So in our uh, planning sessions, we'll look in, at each group of students and determine what their level of need is. For our students who are really hovering right around that norm, really in between the 40th and 60th percentiles, we, we want to provide them with extra practice in their current concepts. We know that they need maybe a, you know, a few extra guided practice problems, a few extra independent practice problems, where as teachers we're working through it with them or they're working you know, with other students to kind of think it through and take some more time to process and to practice and to become proficient. So in that case, a teacher can look at the pacing guide and say, okay, if my students need extra practice, I have and here are the resources, the problem sets, the homework sets. We have MobyMax and we have Study Island, which are supplemental programs that we use. Or I could do standards-based review practice. And then there are links to specific state-based um, resources that they can pull up. For students who are actually below that 40th percentile, we're looking really more at some of the foundational lessons. You know, we will, of course want to kind of stay within their zone of proximal development. So we're going to slide back a little bit and know that maybe those daily lessons were just a little bit out of reach. So we kind of want to backtrack and build up that foundation with them. So we have links to the foundational lessons actually underneath each of our day-to-day -day lessons that they can um, open up in Zern or use Eureka to help again with the small group instruction. We've really started um, paying attention, just like Jen said, we're really focusing on those higher achieving students who we really wanna push that growth. And we know that you know, with, our, with our students who are higher achieving, who are really, a, really well above that norm, you know, they're not showing that they need extra practice in the current concepts that we really need to um, push them a little bit further. But that doesn't necessarily mean moving on to the next grade level standards or, or practice um, in that sense, but really focusing more on the mathematical practices. So how can we actually grow them as critical thinkers, really expand their ability to problem solve, to use different strategies, to work on, uh, collaboratively with their peers to really think through problems in different ways. So as teachers facilitating those conversations in small group instruction, where we're not actually instructing to a specific concept or skill, 
but really more to one of the mathematical practices and behaviors that we, we know that will grow our students are, as mathematical thinkers. So in that case, there are uh, problem solving books that we've created over the last few years that bring in a lot of enrichment type thinking, problems of the week. And so the teachers can look at this and say, okay, here are my group of, my, my um, higher level thinkers or later thinkers in that small group instruction, I can pull these specific resources to work with them. So bringing in that math, that class breakdown and saying, okay, here's what each group of students needs, the teachers then grab those resources and say, okay, during this time, this is what I'm gonna focus on with those students. I think we're ready for the next slide, sorry. No, you're good. <laughs> Sorry. Hi, I'm Kim. I'm the interventionist at Coopertown Elementary. Um, so enter my role during MTSS. So grades one through five, we pull groups both for math and ELA, um, about 40 minutes per group. Um, now that we're three years into this, I think it's interesting to note, you know, we've tried a lot of different things and have learned that it's not a one size fits all. Um, so different grades might need different things and we really tailor to that. Um, so the groups are about five to eight students um, in math. So some of the things I work on, uh, Lauren mentioned the foundational lessons. So really taking it back even a grade level before to really build that, um, those foundations to strengthen what they're currently doing in the classroom. Uh, we also have a program called Do the Math, which is awesome. It has a lot of manipulatives. You see some of the kids with the fraction bars. Um, they love it. There are a ton of games and it just really strengthens what they're doing in the classroom and again just builds that foundation. Um, ELA, everything again is also curriculum aligned. We do foundations, grades one, two, three. And so we'll do a lot of extra practice with that. We'll review. Um, I do a lot of pre-teaching too to give them a little leg up when they learn it in the classroom and that's been really helpful. And with that, I think builds a lot of confidence. The kids come into our room, they feel safe. They feel like they can share with their peers. They might not feel that in the larger classroom. Um, so I, I feel, you know, their shoulders kind of let down when they come into our room and they feel like they can ask questions and get some clarity on things that they're working through in the classroom. So that's it. Just another great set of pictures. Thank you to our interventionists. <laughs> Um, so this is my first time addressing the board in this room since I was I got here in the summertime. So thank you for the opportunity and welcome to new board members who I haven't met yet. Um, so you heard a lot about how this is drilled down into the classroom, but just to kind of take a step back of what it looks like at the entire building level, um, it was exciting for me to come into a district that uses MAP because I also used it in my previous district and we were kind of right around the same point in about two, three years into that um, process. So we were able to start the year at Chestnut Wald with um, actually having the teachers before we even jumped into um, our beginning of the year map assessment, we were able to start the year with looking at data from the previous year. So teachers in first through fifth grade could look at their data from the previous year and think, okay, how did my students do? What did I, what do I know I taught them? What does it seem worked really well? They were also in grades two through five able to look at the data from the students sitting in front of them from the year before to see did these students in front of me meet their projected growth and what am I working with right with these learners so then we went and um, we did in October our first beginning of the year um, map assessment at that point we met as um, grade level teams so our you know my four second grade teachers come into a room with the interventionist reading specialist and we would look at the data see what it tells us across the grade and group into those MTSS groups. So that would happen in each grade level. And then, um, then for the next um, several weeks after that, they are pulling those specific groups and working on specific skills based on the data that they're seeing. Um, coming into the mid-year point, which is, was really exciting for me and you know, being new into the building, um, we had some really great conversations coming, being able to see our mid-year data from our beginning of the year and seeing that growth. Um, and as you heard Ms. Saxon mention, the majority of the teachers in my building, are their goal is um, related to MAP growth. So we were able to not only have another session of regrouping the grade, seeing what skills we want to target and regrouping the students, but also one-on-one -on -one conversations, 
individual conversations with teachers, the interventionists, reading specialists, and to target um, you know, their goal and what they're seeing with the kids in their classroom and what they want to tailor um, to those students in front of them. So um, something that was very exciting for me that came out of these naturally was we are at a point now where, as you heard Dr. Nesbitt say, we are starting to get comfortable with looking at this map data. Um, and I, my teachers shared, it seems like we're ready to start bringing our kids into this a little bit more and having them understand, why do I need to see this as your teacher? What does it tell me? Um, so, and getting them to really take more, have more of an understanding of what this, why we do this and what does it mean for them and how our teachers are tailoring instruction for what they are seeing that their students in front of them need. So um, that was an exciting point for us to move forward into the spring. And then, you know, at the end of the year, we will then again, look at how did it, how did we do? Did we meet our goals? Um, how did our students grow? Um, and, and are our students taking more ownership? So that was a, that's kind of a look at what it looked like at Chesnawald. And I know from my colleagues, it's pretty similar across um, our five elementary buildings. So thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Leash. And, and of course, thank you to everyone who has shared uh, other data up there. Uh, I will just talk about the right-hand side here, some highlights from this uh, map data um, and some focus areas. Uh, as you heard, all grades met or exceeded their growth projections in both math and reading. Uh, additionally, all schools had a median achievement that was in the top two quintiles of performance. Um, it was the goal for our teachers this year that 40 to 60% of their students would meet or exceed growth because that's what is sort of expected. And um, we had 97% of the classes meet that goal already in the winter. Uh, that's in, the, in all of the elementary uh, classes. Um, our areas of focus are gonna be really specific. There was no one grade level, there was no one school, there was no what. So we're gonna really just be drilling down as you just heard, looking at particular grades or a particular subject in a specific school. But most importantly, our teachers, coaches, interventionists, reading specialists, they're all using these data to drill down to individual students and what they need. And, and that's really where our focus remains is you know, how can we help the kids who are sitting in front of us right now? Uh, so that's, that's a summary of our map data, our, our highlights and, and focus areas. Uh, now I'm going to turn it back over to Mrs. Connolly, who's going to talk to us about another reading measure called AIMSWEB. Exactly. Thank you. So in addition to our map assessment that we do for both ELA and for math, we have AIMSWEB Plus, which is a universal screening tool that we use for English language arts standards. We use AIMSWEB in grades K to test letter naming, letter sounds, and the ability to put letters together to read words. In grade one, we measure their sight words and their oral reading fluency. And by grade two and three, we measure all students' oral reading fluency. And in grades four and five, for the most part, we only test students who are not proficient in math to see how they're doing and to continue to make sure we don't lose anyone, that anyone falls through the cracks. So in kindergarten, this is um, now showing so or to orient you. You can see on the left is the 2022-23 year, and that's fall, winter, and spring. Um, and we call these trees. I guess they're really triangles. But um, And on the right is this year, the 23-24. The and of course, we only have the fall and the winter data so far. The green is the students who are proficient in our tier one. Uh, the yellow are you know, the, the students who are on the cusp and who are developing in tier two. And then in the, uh, the red are the tier three or the most struggling students. So the, in this kindergarten um, example, students come in, you know, think about kindergarten. They come in having different experiences from preschool or daycare or home care situations. And so we teach all students with Hegarty to learn to listen to and for sounds and words and foundations to learn the letter names and the sound they make. As you can see, our fall and winter district scores are not significantly different than last year. However, when you visit kindergarten classrooms at this time in the year, you hear students confidently saying their letter names and sounds, breaking apart words, being able to substitute and blend letter sounds, which is the foundation of language, and that's what we need. So students are excited to be able to start, they're just starting to tap out letter sounds like m, mm, app, map, and putting them together and making a word. We expect that our spring triangle will look at least as good as last year. So you can see up there, there's a lot of green and much diminished yellow and red in the one from the 22-23 spring. 
um, because we know the learning that's occurring in our kindergarten rooms is solid. We're implementing foundations with fidelity and we're seeing our students blossom. Now we're gonna look at our first grade. Once again, on the left, you have 22, 23. And then on the right, you have this year, 23, 24. Again, you have fall, winter, spring from last year and this year, just the fall and the winter. Our first grade district scores demonstrate growth with fewer students in the red at the start of this year from last year. Our winter data shows an improvement with 72% of students in the green this year versus 63% last year, about the same in yellow, and only 15% in the red versus 24% in the red last year. We are excited that our percentage of students in the green right now has grown and looks about the same as it did at the end of last year. So that's something that we should be really proud of and excited for. Um, so if we go to this next slide, we're talking just a little bit about the reflections and sort of pulling it all together. In kindergarten, we're presenting pretty similarly to how we did in 22-23, and we expect that we're gonna continue to grow uh, as we did or even better. Our growth is following the national trend. When we look at the trend lines, which I didn't demonstrate, but uh, we checked them out and they we are following the national trend. Historically, there's a great improvement from winter to spring because they move from learning letters and sounds and foundations to tapping and reading words and putting it all together, which is what they're being tested on. And in first grade, Overall, it presents better than the 22-23 school year. In most cases, their growth is better than the national trend. And we have something new this year, fun Foundations Facilitator Training, of which um, Mrs. Erin Duffy is a part of. And so is Erin Smith-Dells, you know, our lead teacher who has been here before, and also Michelle Welsh. And uh, that training is working, and they are working in second grade, which is not demonstrated here, but we are also working on it in Manoa's grade one. And so I think that's also being shown in some of these scores. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over now to um, Miss uh, Amy Hummel and Mrs. Erin Duffy, and they're gonna explain a little bit about how they dig into the data at Linwood, and specifically also about Ames Web. Hi, I'm Amy Hummel from Linwood. So data is an integral part of planning for and delivering instruction. Over the past few years, we have streamlined the process used to review assessment data and plan for targeted MTSS instruction. The first step in using data to drive MTSS instruction is to assess students. Three times per year, a SWAT team in each building assembles to assess students using AIMSWeb and MAP. Once these assessments are complete, it is time to dig deep into, in, into the data to inform instruction. We analyze data by reviewing the results of each AIMSWeb subtest. We consider each student's MAP score and take time to reflect on individual student needs. Data meetings are scheduled every six weeks. At these meetings, administrators, classroom teachers, special education teachers, interventionists, and reading specialists gather to analyze the data as a team. And the first thing we do when we analyze the data is always celebrate student growth and then target areas for instruction are identified. Students with similar needs are grouped together to streamline planning and learning. And for the next six weeks, reading specialists monitor the progress of students receiving the most intensive level of support with appropriate Ames web subtests. Progress monitoring data, along with classroom assessments and observations are used to further tailor instruction. MTSS groups are flexible as students grow and their needs change. Data collected between benchmarking assessments is discussed and groups are adjusted accordingly at the next data meeting six weeks later. The process is cyclical throughout the year. It's always exciting to see the growth in data when benchmark assessments are administered. Thank you so much to all of our interventionists, our coaches, our reading specialists, and of course our administrative team. I, if your feet are hurting, you're welcome to sit down for a minute. <laughs> um, 
We are uh, just uh, very happy to be able to report uh, to a diversity of data that we have here this evening, um, to be able to look back on what last year looked like, to um, share with the community and the board the way we use that and, and set goals because we do see places to make improvements, um, and then share some progress that we think shows some improvement toward those goals. Um, so we are very happy to have had the opportunity to do that. And um, I just wanted to say thank you to you know all the people who are here and, and to all the families and the students for working so hard and, and all the teachers and, and staff who are represented by those who are here this evening. Such a strong indication of, of the genuine dedication that is displayed each and every day by the educators who work uh, with our children and clearly care very deeply uh, about them as learners um, and want to ensure that their experience is as positive as, as possible. Do board members have any questions or comments? I guess one question I have, it, it is um, palpable how the data and the approach to using these tools is being embedded in the staff culture and practices. Um, can anybody speak a little bit to how the kids are doing with this testing and kind of, you know, how they perceive it on a day-to-day -day basis or you know, throughout the year? Do any interventionists or principals want to speak to that since you work most closely with students? You just have to go up to the podium if you're mm -hmm. going to do it. All right, Renee. Uh, Dr. Mosser from Manila is taking the uh, question. Thank you, Dr. Mosser. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. That's a great question. And it makes me very excited because something we tried this year is splitting up the test. So doing the test over two days, it was an idea of the intervention specialist. And in doing that, it cause students to, um, instead of thinking, I have to do all of these questions, it's going to take this length of time. It was a short amount, so 20 questions, and they produced and performed much better as a result of it. And we had one fifth grade teacher actually bring the student up to show their growth. So, I mean, as you saw, I'm a colors person, so colors really help me understand. And to see their growth go from orange to yellow to green to blue like it gets the kids excited so now they go rushing up and saying can I see what I got mm -hmm. so they get super excited so as uh, Mrs. Leach said we want to get students setting goals now because now they're they're holding themselves to a standard of can I get to that RIT score so we're having more conversations so they're getting more involved in the data and it's getting really exciting because we're all invested and that's helpful. I, I think that's really exciting to hear, um, to hear that the kids are invested in getting to particular RIT scores. Now, I would like to know whose job is it to define what a RIT score is for <laughs> the kids? Because as, as I was watching the presentation, one of the things that I get lost in, I'm, I'm an IEP mom, so I'm bilingual in my own way, is what is PVAS? What is this? Why do we trust NWEA? You know, why, why does this make the data meaningful to me as a parent? You know, when I see all those things and I see them without the glossary that obviously you have, it kind of makes me wonder, you know, what is this, right? It's like, this is amazing, right? It's, it's, it's French soup, but it's in French. And the only thing I know is it's soup. You know what I mean? And so, I, I'm glad to hear that the kids are actually, you know, invested in saying, oh, I'm, I'm doing amazing on my PVAS or my RIT or, or whatever that is. Um, I hope that the parents get a glossary, though. Yeah, yeah, I, and I think you're bringing up a point that is always, um, any time we talk about student goal setting, this is exactly what I, uh, I can't let it go by without saying, um, it is so important that we don't just say, my goal is to achieve a number, my goal is to achieve, because how? <laughs> How am I supposed to do that? Am I supposed to read more? A lot of times the answer kids will come up with is, I'll work harder. But that's not, that's not what we're asking you to do. So what I really like about the MAP assessment is when you set goals, it's, it's a really specific goal. Like, I'm going to work on multiplying single digits by single digits. Okay, well, how are you going to do that? You can work with your teacher about that, and I want to just feel more math, oh, that I, can, I have mastered that. 
and and that to me is the absolute key like that's my caveat is if we're going to do student goals the students have to know a behavior that they can engage in and they have to be able to celebrate their progress toward that because otherwise it's just i'm going to work harder and they're already working really hard you know you want them to do it in a targeted way so I thank just, you for raising that i just want to piggyback on that because i met with the interventionist today and i've I meet with the reading specialist um, frequently and i think one of the things that starts to happen with a test like this especially for language arts because it is so long you know they're reading passages online and they're trying to answer questions online um, the students don't always see the value of taking it and so perhaps they're not working as focused they may not they may just decide you know i don't know what this is for they sometimes will ask is this a grade on the report card and when they hear it isn't they're like well then who cares <laughs> um and i think that some of the buy-in that's happened with the classes that have tried it and showing the kids where they were and then having the kids be motivated motivated to find out how they did it is helping them to stay focused it's helping them to have a goal it's helping them to say this does matter i will see it at the end um, instead of you know the same thing happens with pssa you take it and you don't get the scores for months and months and so you don't see the connection um, and now in these couple of places where they've started to share it the kids are starting to see the connection and they're starting to see that it matters the teachers are also saying things like well if you're struggling on this then i'll know that i need to give you additional support and so i'll be bringing you, you into this small group and they're like i don't want to go to that small group so then they maybe pay you know maybe they just focus a little bit more so that was the feedback that i got from teachers when i i actually shared those same things with them so hopefully you know we'll we'll be able to balance give them the tools they need to succeed which may be um, when you start to get you know to zone out stand up walk around come back and start again um, and give them some ability to be able to take these tests which are are really challenging and hard thank you and i just want to piggyback i totally agree the buy-in from the children i'm seeing it in my own fourth grader when he's saying i got i didn't hear it as much on the first map test, but he took it again and he was upset that i forget he didn't do he got higher both times but he did much better in i'll say ela or Matt. and i'm like that's okay but he was really invested and i thought that was phenomenal i think telling them what it's for and he was you know well, next time i'll try maybe i'll get higher there and i was floored because of my three children he is not my most academically motivated and that he you know my other two are and i would have expected that from them but not from him and he was intrinsically mo like I want to get higher and he was bummed out about whatever one and I can't think now what it was but um, I think that's I think that's remarkable great well thank you believe it oh I'm sorry did I just cut someone off I'm sorry, sorry. I'm like Go ahead. Yep. this 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 hot mic thing that I'm so concerned about um, <laughs> As a consumer of the data, um, I know that our school district is making the best choices and choosing the best assessments for our students. Like, I love to see this. As a consumer of the data, I need some of these terms defined. I need to know what these things are. I know what PVAS is because I'm sitting here with the Google, okay? But but <laughs> as, a, as a, a parent of a child, and like I said, I speak fluent IEP, this is something new to me. I'm just consuming your data. And so we're, we're not just selling it to the kids, we're also selling it to the parents and we're also justifying how we make choices. And in the way that we present the data, Data, that usually starts with the definitions right and so you know I'm, I'm I'm old school Temple Institute on Disabilities and what we say is before we use a term we define a term so that everybody in the room knows what conversation we're having and so I'm glad the kids know it's one more thing that we can learn from our kids I learned how to use my iPhone from the kids right and so this is this is kind of amazing I want to trust the credibility of your data so okay. thank you thank you
Okay, well, thank you all. I, I know that um, several of you, I appreciate your staying uh, and your commitment to this presentation. We do have another presentation. So if, it's, if you have other things calling to you from outside of this room, please feel free to attend to those things. Thank you for being here. Uh, we are gonna move on to, again, what we, we talked about as sort of a homework policy discussion. Um, and, and while we're, let me see, do I have that one queued up? All right, great. Um, we, we chose the term discussion uh, purposefully because uh, this has been an ongoing process. We have, I wrote down all this sort of the brief history of where we are in discussing homework um, and how we got to this point. Uh, and it really is still a discussion. Uh, so uh, in, back in 2010, uh, before I think many of us were here, a homework policy was approved uh, and, and following that there was an implementation period of that homework policy. Um, we didn't really hear much about it until really pandemic times, virtual uh, learning times across the country. Uh, all work was homework for a period of time. And then when we returned, schedules were different and messaging was different around homework. And, and so that sort of came to our attention right around this time last year, maybe a little bit earlier, maybe closer to the beginning of winter last year. Um, and, and we came together and we really made a recommitment to our current homework policy, which does require homework and we needed to communicate that out to um, teachers and make sure that we um, you know eliminated old messaging and renewed this commitment to homework and as we did that uh, members of the board asked us to really ask the teachers what do they think about homework and, and bring back any potential um, changes or, or, or tweaks to policy uh, so we did that and I believe it was in June of last year after having looked at some homework research after having had some conversations we brought back some sort of minor changes some some expanded time frames for um, using uh, for, for guidelines for how long homework should occur some changes to language to be sort of more accurate reflect students instead of pupils that kind of thing um, but but no real substantive change and, and at that time there when we brought that to uh, the policy committee um, the the policy committee said to us you know what what's really at the crux of this is one word and that was the word expected is homework expected or is it suggested? Um, and they, they um, said that they would like us to take sort of a bigger look at the policy and not just tweak it, but like really genuinely ask ourselves that question. And so we did take it back to um, then further research. We um, had further conversations with um, our staff. We looked back at, um, sort of what is happening and finding out from students and from teachers and, and hearing from the parents who contacted us what is going on so that we could um, develop sort of a set of um, some language that we could have a discussion about this evening. Mm, here's my clicker. Uh, just as a, this is just a list of some, we did, this is not every article or study or anything that we uh, looked at, but these are some of those that we've looked at. Some of these are older, uh, some of them are newer. You'll find that homework has been talked about for just about as long as homes have existed. So um, you're going to find a lot of information. A lot of it refers back to the same um, studies. So uh, I'm going to turn it over to Sandy to talk to us a little bit about our proposed path forward. And then we're going to share some of our um, ideas with you as, a, as an elementary principal team. I should say, I'm sorry, I didn't say this already. Um, the, the discussion really focused, it started honing in on, on really focusing on grades three to five. Uh, we did not have that many questions about what's happening at the secondary level. There were not many questions about how homework is looking at K through two. Um, so we're really focused on elementary homework for tonight. Um, and then we'll see if there's more to discuss. We can discuss more. So Sandy, thank you. Okay, so our proposed path forward. Our next steps will include a lot of continued communication. Tonight, there's gonna be an opportunity to discuss and ask questions, which uh, Ms. Saxer just described. Following this discussion, we'll go back and reflect and respond to the questions and the comments that we receive. Teachers have been a part of the process as she described in both focus group and through communication from their principals. So we will return to teachers to share the discussion and get their input. The changes will determine if the next steps are to bring the new language to the curriculum committee or to the policy committee. As the policy goes through different readings, the teacher focus group will be updated. Once the policy has been adopted, we have the timeline and we have the timeline for implementation, then all the stakeholders will be informed. During the summer, teachers will be encouraged to collaborate to develop some homework menus, choice boards, assignments, and suggestions by grade level. 
and this will continue to be ongoing work. Thank you, Mrs. Connolly. And now we'll welcome Mrs. McGilvery up to talk to us about the really com the complexity of uh, looking at homework. Yes, good evening. We have had many discussions, lively discussions on this topic um, for quite a long time, at least for the past year in several different sessions in different contexts. And the truth is there are so many different lenses with which we approach this work. Um, those of us who have young children or are in it right now remember our own experiences when we're talking to teachers, when we're talking to each other, when we're um, hearing from parents about different things. There are really so many factors that go into it. Um, and it's really interesting to, to think about all of the different perspectives. Um, ideas about how much homework is appropriate for each student varies uh, depending on who you're talking to. And uh, the, the one thing that is most consistent, however, is that it is meaningful. Whatever the homework is, it should absolutely be meaningful for the child, and the child should be able to do it independently. Um, we have reviewed the research, as we just shared with you. Much of the research that is still the most frequently cited is dating back to the 80s. Um, had we had very clear, direct, conclusive modern research, it might be a little bit easier for us to you know, even have this discussion or guide us in the right way because um, it's so back and forth. But consensus essentially is that the homework would be assigned weekly for students, um, which would give some flexibility to students and families depending on the extracurricular activities, depending on um, you know, what, what the family situation is every night. Um, Time-based guidelines we have talked about. In the past, it was something like 10 minutes for first grade, 20 minutes for second grade. But the truth is, if you know I did the same assignment that my colleagues did, all three of us might take different time amounts to finish the same assignment. And so that one is a little bit tricky. Um, and at-home resources. Um, different children have different situations, and we want to uh, be thoughtful and considerate to uh, the support that students may or may not need to do something independently. So lots of um, different perspectives um, continue to be encouraged, but um, continue to be reviewed, excuse me. But really, we've spent a ton of conversation ourselves as a K-5 administrative team. We've talked with different teacher groups, different teacher focus groups. We've talked with students. We've talked with parents. Um, there's a lot of perspectives on this. As you heard Mrs. McGilvery uh, share in the, in the previous slide, the most cited research is from 1989, but that research did find a positive and statistically significant relationship between the amount of homework students do and their achievement outcomes, and that relationship increases at the higher grades. Uh, the research found that completing homework regularly develops good study habits, and when it's meaningful, uh, it enhances learning. Our teachers would agree that they see positive impacts on students who complete homework regularly as it reinforces the skills they are currently learning. Our teachers also find that homework supports the home and school communication, and when students follow the homework guidelines, it enhances their study habits. Uh, along with assigned homework, our teachers all agree that there are so many benefits from reading independently or being read to, so we always include that um, in our homework expectations. As you heard, Ms. Saxa and Mrs. McGilvery share. Last year we engaged teachers and students in conversations about homework, so I want to turn it back over to Ms. Saxa to kind of talk through the numbers of what, you know, what those numbers represent. Thank you, Mrs. Leach. Um, you'll see this on the next couple of slides. It's just um, some sort of uh, information about when we had those conversations with teachers and students. We asked them, what are some of the benefits? This is like the case for homework. The next slide is the case against homework. So we're like presenting all the sides. Um, and so some of the positives that teachers said, and you can see 17 times, uh, we heard teachers mention something about those sort of uh, life skills, we'll call them, they used to be called soft skills, but they're really life skills of time management, responsibility, independence. That was the most cited positive of homework. Um, also reinforcement and practice was eight, and then you can see you know, communication was five, so that's what the number means, is sort of the number of mentions among the various groups. Um, and then when you ask students, they said, well, it does help us practice uh, and it does help us build our independence, which is always nice. They liked the games and choice uh, when it was possible to give those, they liked those. Um, so that's that case for homework. Now we're gonna hear actually from Dr. Whitehead, who was also unable to be here, but is by video going to uh, share with us the case against homework. Um, and we'll hear from him.
I think everyone from Chatham recognizes that smile from the Please, morning announcement. Board members, fellow colleagues in attendance and administrators, and hello to our Halford Township School District community. I'm Jabari Whitehead, proud principal of Chatham Park here to talk to you about the case against homework within our segment, the homework policy recommendation presentation. Homework, the case against it. First of all, we believe that it may penalize those without support or space at home. What that means is that not every child is blessed with having family members or the a safe space to or a quiet space to have time to do the homework. They may not have the resources, the informational resources. So it could penalize those students without those specific variables without those particular resources. Also, homework can take away time for other activities, whether it's religious or meaningful family time or healthy activities such as sports, dance, music interests, or anything of, of those nature. They can pull away from those times, even service clubs. A, another note is about the parental and child stress that homework may cause. Sometimes families might not feel very efficacious about students and how to help their students, how best to help them, what tools or resources or information to gather. And it could simply come down to an argument or frustration or, or a tough relationship over homework, but there's other priorities that need to be addressed in the household. And it, adds, it can add undue stress. And then lastly, it's the idea that if homework is wrote, and it's not meaningful or connected, then it's very difficult to gain student buy-in, and which then becomes counterproductive, holding back or creating an obstacle to gain any benefits for the learner or the teachers or the families overall. From the teachers and students, you know, they both may communicate concerns about, you know, the lack of support at home, the lack of resources, the, the tough situation of having time to complete all the assignments, the, if there's a lack of differentiation or just the fact that it may not be motivating to do a homework where you're worn out from a long a school day as well. Uh, it's, it's definitely something that we'll continue to look at uh, as far as the case against homework. Again, there's the case against homework and case for homework. So, but these in tonight, tonight we want to present to you some of the factors that can serve against homework that we need to be aware of. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Dr. Whitehead, sign off. So many thanks to Dr. Whitehead for recording that video. Um, just one more note that he didn't mention in the video. We have talked a little bit about that, the research. And um, so the research shows that um, there is an effect size. That effect size really begins around grade four, and they call it a minimal effect, effect size. It's about 0.16. Um, some people believe that it's not until 0.4 that an effect size is really something that should be um, captured and it doesn't hit that until grade six um, from this particular meta-analysis, the one that keeps getting cited. So we just mentioned research in the four. I wanted to make sure we had the research in the against too, so I added that part in. And Dr. Whitehead had talked a little bit there about what our teachers and our students said were sort of the, the hard parts of homework or, or how homework is not helpful. Um, when it is assigned, if it's assigned in the ways as described. Um, up next, we have our homework guidelines. So what does the research say? Much of the research says, listen, this is a tough call. So if you're going to assign homework, make sure you do it this way, right? Uh, they don't even make a recommendation in a lot of what we read. Um, so uh, Dr. Mosser from Manoa is going to tell us a little bit about what that research says for guidelines. Yeah, so the first guideline is purposeful, which defines meaningful. So what does that look like? It can be new, um, introducing new content. It's a practice that should be done independently. It can elaborate or deepen um, or explore personal or interest. And um, then they talk about challenging. And challenging should have a level of difficulty, but not a level of frustration. It should have a success rate. So it that challenge should kind of be a motivation to become more interested in going deeper into the learning and include some sort of choice. This is the part that I found very interesting, the homework involvement. So as a parent myself and as have, raising young children, 
I oftentimes was either policing homework or I was teaching homework. And sometimes I felt like I wasn't as smart as a fifth grader because they learned things much differently than I did going to school. But here, this involvement was like appropriate involvement. And it looks like including adults or people at home as a soundboard. Can you listen to my essay and tell me what you think? Or an interview. Can you tell me what school looked like when you went and compare it to what we are currently going through? So it has a little twist on what home involvement can look at. And as Mrs. McGilvery said earlier, that time allotment, usually 10 minutes per grade level, but what's most important here is not the time allotment, more so the completion. And as she so eloquently stated, what I do, what you do, that might look very different. I might finish something earlier or I might need a little bit more time. So it's a guideline. It's not must do for this amount of time. And once again, Mrs. Sachs is going to talk about um, our teachers and our student input with that. Thank you, Dr. Mosser. So um, our teachers also believed in, in assigning weekly versus nightly. Uh, this is the elementary folks. Uh, they believed that they saw um, achieve, achievement and gains when students were able to pa practice math facts. Uh, they agreed that it should be independent and include reading independently. Um, there, the place where we really couldn't come to consensus was whether or not it should be at least this much homework, whether it should be never more than that much homework, whether it should be yes, there's definitely homework, whether it should be no, it's totally optional. We did not have consensus. We continue to sort of not have consensus on that. Um, our students did find that um, if you're going to have a guideline, they liked reading for 20 minutes. They thought that was a good guideline right there. They liked having paper as well as online, uh, but they particularly mentioned paper math in particular, um, assigned over the week, like we said. They liked the creative projects. Some of them really did like the online games, of course. And um, can you believe it? As a former English teacher, my heart smiled when three of them mentioned vocabulary and grammar as good homework. Thank you. Um, so we were happy to see that. Uh, that as well. The, the next slide here is just, uh, we, we shared this, I think, at a, a prior meeting, but just to put it up here again, we did go ahead and, and look through, you know, combed websites and, and handbooks, et cetera, of local districts to try and find out what is what are other people requiring when it comes to homework. And so this is these are the districts we found information on locally. Five out of seven do require homework of some kind. Four out of the seven had time-based guidelines. And four out of the seven, they did include reading, uh, a couple of them did not include reading. They said, in addition to reading, you should be doing this homework. So that's just sort of to, to get a survey of what's happening around here. Um, uh, so in January, as we mentioned, we took all of the information that I just shared, that we just shared with you, and we took it to the um, third through fifth grade teachers in the district. We had a little focus group of them um, where we had representation from every grade and, and every school, and we asked them to sort of weigh in on the matter. And they came up with some updated suggestions here um, that you're going to, you know, it's a little bit of a repeat. Meaningful homework, um, offer choice, and, and to be very clear about what the homework is so nobody's starting questioning um, right away. Uh, type and frequency of homework should continue to be guided by current research. So that was a, an important piece that they just didn't want to get behind. They were like, well, what does the research say? What are they saying now? How is it different than it was 30 years ago? So that was important to them. Um, they, th they felt like they are assigning somewhere around those general guidelines. But I, you know, if you ask the kids, uh, again, the gu time guidelines are challenging. Uh, again, they, they agreed with the focusing on uh, completing an identified number of assignments uh, well, meaningful assignments well, as opposed to just like work, you know, write for 20 minutes and stop. It's no, write a paragraph analyzing what you read and then stop. If it takes you too long, then stop and we'll finish again tomorrow was sort of their suggestion there. And they agreed with assigning weekly, which you've heard many times. Um, so. Get ready for like taking out your reading glasses here. Sorry. This is uh, what we did here is just to put on the slide. So you had it. Um, this is our current language or our current draft language. Anything not highlighted has already been presented to the policy committee. Um, then what we did is we just highlighted a couple of things here that we added in as a result of this continued research and conversation. So in a couple of places it's really minor, like it says secondary students instead of middle school students. Um, 
And then uh, there's a little section sort of at the bottom, the most green at the bottom. There's my little pointer here. This was later in the policy. We just moved it up because it was sort of like nobody was reading by the time they got to the end of the policy. So we put it toward the beginning of the policy. Um, and we did add in for discussion here the, um, the homework assignments should um, meet the criteria established by current research. So we would try and our best to keep current on these things. Uh, depending on what that means. And then we did add, based on the research as well, some language in the creative section that already existed about the types of homework, um, providing students opportunities to explore topics of their own interest. So that's one of our modernized assessment committee, one of our preparing contemporary citizens, is really letting kids be self-directed in what they do. So if there's an opportunity for that in homework, we want to encourage that as well. So we thought that might be helpful to have the language there. Um, this, this we pro would propose adding this section because we feel like it helps flesh it out for teachers, students, families to understand like what should and shouldn't homework look like. Again, purposeful as Dr. Mosser described, um, challenging um, as Dr. Mosser described, appropriately involving parents as Dr. Mosser described, and then integrated. We wanted to really uh, include that piece because it does show up in, in what we read. It's important that the homework doesn't take over for parents and families with the whole evening, right? And, and that there is a point where you're able to say, okay, that's enough. Now we'll tell your teacher and you, you try it again tomorrow. If you can convince your kids to do that, which I know is not always easy. Again, this is sort of language that already exists. And then in the green, we've added a few things. It was important to our principal crew um, that we add in there that the homework needs to be assigned in consideration of what individuals and groups of students need because it needs to have the flexibility to be differentiated. Just because someone assigned you some writing homework, maybe I need to work more on my reading and so that's where I'm gonna work. And that needs to be um, sanctioned in the policy to, to allow that. Um, some other stuff is just changing the word pupil to students. Um, number one, oh, I don't know why the numbers won the numbers are wonky there. Sorry about that. We, we will fix that if if this gets to you know a more formal process. Uh, we did just add a line because that was smushed in with the other stuff and it wasn't pulled apart and we felt like it should be um, just pulling out the intermediate grades because you talk specifically about other grades. Um, and then finally, the really like the drum roll please part here is that we, we are maintaining because of what we read that generally there should be homework. There should be homework. We didn't say it, that like it's all optional. Generally, the assignment of homework should be as follows. And then I'm gonna get to the what as follows is, but it is not changing it from an expectation to an option. What we did change, however, uh, which is I think sort of the point for discussion tonight I would imagine, um, is going really trying to move away from the time allotment and moving toward a number of assignments. Uh, because if you can say, I need every student to be able to do these three things tonight, or I need every student to be able, at this point of mastery, uh, so they need this much practice, then that might be um, a more accurate way to think about your homework than to send something home and think, okay, I think it's gonna take about 10 minutes a night. Um, and so our suggestions here are, kindergarten and grade one, read or be read to nightly, and or, it might be that it's just that some nights, and or one to three assignments per week across all the subjects. So kindergarten and grade one, that shouldn't really be any more than what we're already doing. Um, but we did wanna put in there, time spent should not exceed the equivalent of 10 minutes daily, right? Because we don't want those kids working too hard without any other direction, especially considering their little attention spans. Grades two and three, we have read nightly and one to three assignments per week in math, one to three assignments per week in ELA, science and social studies as needed. Time spent should not exceed uh, the equivalent of 30 minutes daily, giving parents and, and kids a guide. Grades four and five, read nightly and, and now you see an increase to the number of assignments, two to four assignments per week in math and ELA, science and social studies still as needed, and then um, not exceeding the equivalent of about 50 minutes per day. And so um, that sort of is what, what we're hoping is sort of a combination of what we've learned, what we've heard from our community, um, something that could be manageable, but still improve um, where we know that homework can improve, not only in those life skills, but also academically, um, but do that in a way that's 
still conducive to a harmonious home environment because you know we don't want homework to be that stressor although i know i can say that's on blue in the face and it will still be a stressor in a lot of cases we're going to try and do what we can to mitigate that and set some realistic expectations but still have an expectation of homework I just ask a clarifying question. Yep. So when you have, um, like if we just take grade two and three, yeah. so that list. Um, so you have several things that are per week, but then the time should not ex exceed a certain amount a night. Does that mean then you're adding up every night to be the total of the week? Like I, I'm just a little confused on how that then is a measure for teachers to use. I know it's like a math problem built in, isn't it? Yeah. It's not supposed to be. That's why we did the should not exceed the equivalent of 30 minutes daily because one day it might take you 45 minutes, but then you don't do anything tomorrow in that okay. subject. So we wanted to sort of like about average it out because some families like Tuesday, you can't do anything. So you got to do twice as much on Wednesday. Okay. That was the thinking, but we, I mean, so that still is it. two and a half hours. Yeah. Yeah. It, right. It should still, um, total about that. And you know what, when we did the time expectations and we may want to include this in here, but when we did have time expectations in the last draft, we multiplied that times four, not times five. Okay. So we were, we were suggesting that really, you know, as much as possible, homework doesn't happen over the weekend. We don't have that in our policy. Some places do. Some places have it doesn't happen over the weekend. And it doesn't happen over breaks. We didn't want to be too restrictive, but like the general expectation is it's not always over the weekend um, unless the practice is to assign it on Monday and it's not due until the next Monday to provide even more flexibility as opposed to Monday, Friday. Looking, we have some high school students in the yeah. back, and um, I'm reminding them that they're talking about K to five. Yes, don't get excited. <laughs> yeah. Don't get excited. <laughs> um, okay, so I have a, a lot because I have been chomping at the bit since October, not this past October, the October before, as Dr. Rushi and Ms. Saxa. No, I mean, I did not, I was not at the policy meeting when I did um, watch it afterwards. I was fine with the word expect. I think expectations are good. You expect more, you get more. You expect less, you get less. And expectation doesn't mean mandate. Um, you know, there, there was always flexibility. I, I think it might be helpful for um, people to know, like pre-COVID, what things look like. Because um, my oldest entered the district at Linwood in 2012, graduated Linwood in 2018. My middle son entered 2014, graduated. 2020 and their experience was very much the same um you know kindergarten you would get the in the communication book the try this try writing your name kindergarten style but that took one minute it was never or write the alphabet it might that might have taken three minutes it was very basic and then you know you got a little first grade second um i i've never hit any of these requirements uh, it was always appropriate homework with the exception, Mrs. McGillivray, those bottle buddies, if they're gone in fifth grade by next year, I would appreciate it. That was crazy. But other than that, all their homework in math and LA was very appropriate. Uh, the teachers, and by and large, my two children had very um, different teachers. They always said, you know, hey, if it takes more than 20 minutes, put a star. Tell Mr. H couldn't do this. Like, you know, Miss So couldn't do this. Um, it was never a stressful experience. I honestly, I always looked at my children's homework to see what they were doing. And I'm sure there must have been a handful of times I've helped them, but they did it on their own. I would just check, oh, they're doing clocks. And then we'd be at a gym that weekend for basketball. Hey, what time, you know, I might reinforce it in that manner. But that was, um, I thought it was very functional. Um, there was teacher discretion. Um, never, it was never excessive, ever, ever, ever. And so I think if you have a child, um, so my middle son is in ninth grade now. My oldest is in 11th. If you have a child in the high school or graduated, like President Weidman, like your ex experience is probably like mine. Um, if you have a younger one, you have a totally different experience. Though I will say when my youngest who entered Linwood in 2019, um, they did still have the same kindergarten try this in the communication book. COVID happened, everything gets blown out of the water. And that following year, um, when it started out virtual and went to hybrid. Obviously, of course, no one wanted home. Everything was homework. I would have revolted if you asked me to do homework on top of the work that was at home all day, but we never got back to that. Um, so my son is in fourth grade now, and in second grade, 
we never resumed the talking to people um, in other school districts and obviously at private and parochial schools, they were having that. And um, it kind of came to me far ahead in, in third grade um, as Dr. Rishi and Ms. Saxon know when my son had a problem with math and I was not able to help him because I didn't know what he was doing. And my son, my youngest, if you have a COVID error child, a young child who was, you know, impacted greatly as you would if you had a K, one, two, three, um, during COVID, he does need help. He needs, I am much more involved than I ever, ever was. Like I said, I can't remember helping my older children with homework. And again, I'm sure it did happen a handful of times, but I'm with him. He needs help, these children. Um, and, you know, uh, Ms. Sachs, as you said, we're not meeting growth goals in fourth through fifth grade. Um, and that's, these are the, they're those COVID kids. They're the ones who were impacted, I believe, the most by the shutdown. How could they not be? And, you know, nothing we can do about that. But we weren't giving them, um, we never returned to that homework. And I, I think that was troubling to me because I've always believed homework was great for uh, time, it kind of goes in with the contemporary citizen school. It's good for responsibility, accountability, time management. These are life skills that children will need, but it's also good for reinforcement and for mastery. And I think a perfect example is math facts. Um, and well, in reinforcement and mastery, I mean, we practice, I think I wrote here, like, well, if you want to get better at anything, you have to practice. That's anything in, in life. You just don't show up to the basketball game or the track meet or the band concert and not practice you have to practice. I mean, I mean, to my knowledge, that's how this, no one just does that. If you just show up to the track meet, you never went to a track practice, you're not going to do well. Why would academics be any different? And the perfect example is something like math facts. There's no child who just uh, seven times five, seven times five is 35. You have to practice that. And I know that was uh, one of the key homework things for my older two boys at Linwood, starting in second grade and continuing into third, there was uh, math back practice. And again, when I say daily homework, it was Monday through Thursday. They never had any homework on the weekend, nor do I believe they should. But it was interesting to me, like we had, and I wrote this down years ago, it was at a March 23rd, 23 meeting in Dr. Nesbitt, when we were talking about um, MTSS and what a great program that is. You know, he had said, oh, it's impossible to support someone who doesn't know multiplication facts in fourth grade when you're doing fractions, if, who doesn't know multiplication facts in fourth grade when you're doing fractions. And I laughed and I thought, well, yeah, and why don't they know multiplication facts? Because they were never made to. Um, and I'm hearing that now from elementary school teachers, like they're behind. And what troubles me was we had this disconnect. As a parent, it troubles me. And as a board member, we have this policy. We haven't done it since, reviewed it since 2010. Now it's 2024. Um, and, the pol and there was a big disconnect between policy and practice, taking out that virtual hybrid year, which of course, but when I was questioning why there was no homework last year, I was being told at, at first, um, you know, and I was specifically targeting math because that's where my son was having some problems and I wanted to support him as best I could. I was told um, by three teachers at Linwood at different grades that they were not allowed to give math homework per Dr. Nisbet. And I want to give anyone the benefit of the doubt, but um, I thought maybe there's bad communication to Linwood. And I went to someone at every other elementary school in two, two more than... Um, Two of the elementary schools, just one teacher, multiple teachers at two of the other, and they said the same thing, that we're not allowed to give math homework per Dr. Nesbitt. And I thought, this is why, like, we, they need this practice. There's certain things that you need to do. I even had an article, I just printed out about how we have to return to some of that practice. And I do think homework has to be functional. No one once wrote busy work, but there are some things that kids just need to, to do to practice. And, um, you know, I think you also, we talked about a little bit earlier about the buy-in for, you know, map testing. Oh, it's good when they see they're progressing, but, you know, now they, I'm glad to see that homework is back in fourth grade this year, but, you know, one thing that I think we're so afraid of, there's, there's really not much, I'm glad that there's some, but like uh, fourth grade has vocabulary, for instance, um, 15 to 20 words every two weeks, but there's no homework with it. And 
I have two of my son's best friends talking to their parents. They're bombing these tests. Nine out of 25, 14 out of 25. My son's best friend told his mother, I'm just stupid. I can't get this. He is not stupid. This child is not stupid. He's a very smart little boy. My son's other, but you can't expect kids if you don't hey, write, you know, write five sentences. And like, it's kind of nonsensical to me. We're not supporting these kids. No one's saying it has to be a lot, but when, if you, and don't believe me, ask, everybody knows in this township, someone in parochial school, private school, you might know people in Lower Marion across your neighbors because of the way the township divides. They're all doing um, more to support these kids. And just, I, I think we need to get back to a little bit more expectations. And I think that's been a little lacking. I have more to say, but I'll cut myself off now to let other people speak. Um, I just wanted to ask a, a question or two, right? I mean. I, I assume, I hope, I know we're trauma-informed here, right? So is there space in this policy for the children who have, you know, those ACEs or those things that keep them from being able to do homework? Do the teachers have the flexibility to have those conversations without having to um, humiliate, dive in, go deeper into um, those things? Like, I, I just, I'm, I'm curious about that and... And again, you know, as an IEP mom, you know, I've always had to give my kid her own homework and help her with it. And so I know that, you know, parents of students without those challenges also have that ability. But I just want to make sure that we are not saying to children who are, you know, newly discovering, you know, whatever their neurodivergence may be, or students who legitimately have things that keep them from being able to do 20, 30, 40 minutes of homework, appropriate, um, well-intended, fits our guidelines. Do we have a way to not only keep them from being, you know, in the, in the bottom undeservedly, right? I mean, because if everybody's getting 50 points and you don't have 20 minutes to get your 50 points, are we doing anything to keep them off the bottom of our map testing data, data whatever, right? Is that somewhere written in this, in this policy? Like, is that somewhere there? You know, I, I think that's a good point. I know that it is our practice to always make exceptions, work with families, work with students. But I, I do, I, I will look and see what language we might be able to find in other policies or in recommendation policies, just to really make that clear that that's okay. Because sometimes, you know, teachers want to have like permission from the policy to do something like that. So uh, I do think it would be helpful to have really clear language with that. I'll and I, and that. I appreciate that. And I'm not only talking special education, we all know I'm an educate. well, we don't know. I'm an education surrogate and I have students that I have to communicate with through a language line. So even though I can give them 20 minutes to read the story, we're not speaking the same language. I don't have access to the language line. Maybe the parent doesn't speak English. And that's very non-specific data that I can prove if you make me. And so I just want to make sure that we are, you know, holding everyone to a standard, but also being flexible for those, those among us who can afford to live here, but maybe not have the same standard that we all have. I think what, what I'm hearing you say to uh, restate maybe in different words that I might use, you want the teachers who are professionals to be able to use their professional judgment. I and, do. And that's what's, that is important to us. And I also want that to be expected, like, mm -hmm. right? Like yeah. I want that to be expected with the homework. And mm -hmm. I, I would love to see a footnote or something that says, yeah. you know, you, use your trauma-informed best judgment. Mm -hmm. Whatever words you guys use for that, I'm sure there's an acronym out there that I <laughs> will never know, but I would like to see that too. Just want, oh, you go. Oh, just want to say um, the the language un, the language is under consideration that the highlighted portions. I, I'm I'm thrilled to see that the things in there for meaningful homework. That is, I think, a a, a very important thing. That is, can be applied, I believe, to all grade levels, not just through through three through five. Um, and similarly with the um, with the uh, sort of time spent should not exceed X amount of minutes per day. I mean, I have, I have, a, I have a son who's second grade who does his weekly assignments on Monday. Just, I can't stop him. He just wants to do them. I'd say, fine. But there also are nightly assignments. And I think that it's important to have that mix in there as well so that, so that kids can use some, some time management. I just want to know, moving, m moving forward, I know that the guidelines or the 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 the, the Rough guidelines are about 10 minutes a night aggregated per grade. Looking ahead a little bit, is that going to be 
continued through middle school and high school? Are we going to look at different metrics as, or different kind of uh, 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 guidelines as we, as we move forward? Has there been any discussion about that yet? Yeah, I'm just trying to think about a whole holistic policy for all of this. Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you for raising that. What we found is what's in our policy is basically what's in the research. So it's about 60 minutes in sixth grade. Um, it says that it should increase according to the course complexity of what they're taking. Um, and then really it's it's sort of the research is a not to exceed two and a half hours for most students at the high school level. It starts to get diminishing returns. Um, so our, our language says that it might not be unusual for someone with AP courses and, and heavy caseloads to have up to three hours a night, but that, that's not like the general expectation. So that would be the only place we might, you know, uh, adjust that a little bit, but it's, it, we were already in line with what they That's what I was kind of going with that. Yeah. I'm, I'm just, you know, doing the math. I mean, it's 12th grade. That's it's right. a, a lot of time uh, yeah. throughout the week, but, 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 but I do believe that if you, you know, parse it out to be not to exceed in this week. That, that I think might make a little bit more uh, sense. And then, I mean, you said that we're not sending homework over weekends. Yeah. Um, but it's not prohibited. Yeah, it's, <laughs> I guess. it's so not, that's, right, right. Okay. That's not currently. I mean, if, if people yeah. were interested in adding that in there, we could. I just well, like you, to provide some flexibility to, to teachers. You know, it, there might be a big project or there might be something that takes them a little longer. Okay. And I'm just curious also, real quick, just to, just to back up a little bit on a couple of slides here. You mentioned that uh, you, you looked at these seven school districts in, in only in five homework is required. I'm just curious, what, are you able to share which ones it was yeah, not required? I'm just find my spreadsheet, Mr. Schwartz. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I, I will, you know what, I will go back because I don't want to do it too and, quickly yeah. and like not say the right thing out loud. So I will get you that information. It's my own, okay. Yeah, it's yep. my, my own curiosity. I'll show you I my little spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. And I wondered with that with the local districts like you said you pulled off of websites and policies they might find a similar thing that we did that we had a stated thing in the policy and then found in application across different. different buildings it's different so it, like just to, to say oh we know a lot about these seven districts now mm -hmm. I think would be overstating how much we can right rely on them mm -hmm. yes this is a survey of published materials yes mm -hmm. thank you sure one quick question. Um, you mentioned not wanting to be firm around the weekends. I am curious, though, why not to be firm around breaks? We don't have very many breaks, and being able to have kids just be able to not worry about homework for that break and for families to not have to negotiate that when they're juggling travel and other things. I'm just, I'm just curious why breaks might need to still be flexible. You know, uh, we told our little focus group of teachers that were kind enough to meet with us that we would come back to them with questions. I would love to just pose that to them mm -hmm. and just find out, like, does that ever happen? Would that be prohibitive if we were to say something about that? Yeah. Do that. And let, I'll let you know what they Thanks. Yeah. Um, I just want to echo, I like what Mr. Schwartz said, in the mix of weekly and nightly assignments. Um, I mean, I do think it's important to have math. We're talking four nights a week. And I'm looking just at two to three. I'm not looking at K and one. Um, you know, I I know even just a basic ten minutes of math, that five to ten minutes of math, that practice, that to me, in my mind, and that's honestly when my older two learned to multiply at Linwood and all of their. That was what they were doing then. So I I would like. I mean, I personally think that should be, there should be daily math, Monday through Thursday, four times a week. Um, and also, I just want to throw out there, it's something that my son's wonderful teacher does, but, um, and it's he's in fourth, but, you know, reading nightly, we all know reading is so important. And, um, but we all also know when you say read 20 minutes on crazy nights, uh, what gets chucked um, reading nightly, because, you know, I, if you, if it's a bonkers night and, you know, all hell's breaking loose. Okay, well, that math page will get done because, you know, it's a page, but okay, well, um, we'll make up for it. To my, like, it's just by nature, but what I, I really love, and I think this makes um, it more meaningful homework, um, you know, tying the reading in with, um, like I said, my son's teacher is amazing, and it, um, my middle son had her as well. Just a simple question. They get um, a log at the beginning of the week and it's a question from Monday through Thursday. And it's a different question every, every night. I mean, you, there are repeats throughout. I mean, every couple of weeks you see the same ones, but you know, what type of, what genre is the book you're reading? How do you know this? 
Okay, just as simple, but it works on it's writing skills, which they so desperately need because they're doing a lot more than what I would like on the on the um, Chromebook. And you know, um, compare and contrast uh, contrast a character from the book you're reading now to the book you read before. What what are two ways they're alike? And it just gets you thinking text to text. Sometimes it's text to um, world, text to self, and but it gives you more accountability for reading, which we know is so important and tied to success. And um, I, I love that tying. It makes it, to me, more functional. Um, and it's just, I think, writing is something that should kind of, that we, I know that's language arts, but it ties in. And um, I, I think that it it's, makes a good functional homework. Can I just bring Sandy, a different yes. perspective um, from the language arts point of view, being the humanities curriculum coordinator, supervisor. Um, when we think about reading nightly, and we all maybe do this, right? You get a chance to get into bed and you read. If I had to get out of bed and go answer a question every night, I wouldn't like reading very much. And so one of the things that we've talked about with teachers is, is there, is there a way to have students become accountable for reading, but also to build a love for reading? Because the 10 best ways to become a better reader are to read, 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 right? That's what's going to grow your vocabulary, your fluency, your background knowledge, your love for reading, your content knowledge, your academic vocabulary. It grows all of it, the pure act of reading. And so because this is a discussion and we aren't making decisions, I just want to throw out there that we want to consider um, and I talk to teachers who have, because I have to sign off whenever they print these reading logs and things, to suggest that they say, maybe you have kids answer two questions a week. Or, you know, I don't even think it's necessary to write down how many pages you read, because once you get started reading, if you like it, you keep reading, right? And if you don't like it, then let's switch the book and give you something you do like to read. But I want us to be conscious of if we're trying to build a reading habit and all those auxiliary things that come along with reading, then we wanna be careful about mandating that they have to write something every day because I can tell you if I had to go home tonight and read the Rose Code and then write down you know, the main idea of that chapter, I wouldn't wanna pick it up again tomorrow. And so it's just that that's Oh, no, and I hear what, I mean, I would be the same way. I would not want to, I have a book on my nightstand that, yeah. well, I don't know if I'm going to read it tonight. It's a little late. But um, if it wasn't tonight, I would read it. And, but I, I, I see a different thing with my, my son. This gives him more accountability. He still reads, it's, it's almost like a separate thing. He reads when it's his reading time. And then when we're, do, when we're doing written, it's like a different, but it, it gives the accountability that he read. It, it's not tied together. Well, get, stop reading now and come down. Well, you don't, I don't do that. I don't think people should do that. Stop your reading and get down here and write. No one's doing that, but it just then becomes the writing homework, but it makes it functional. And, and I have seen a great improvement in his, I had seen a decrease in his handwriting skills, to be honest. And he always had pretty, pretty decent handwriting because they think they're doing so much more on these Chromebooks. And um, that's how I'm seeing it. But I, I don't think it should, I think you have a good point that, never to stop your reading, but I'm seeing a different thing with my, my son. Yep. And um, looking at the time and it being 6.30, yes. um, I am going to suggest that we try to wrap it up. And I was going to suggest too that, um, you know, we have the look at where this conversation next happens. Is it policy? Is it to come back to this committee? I think as a policy, I would suggest that um, the board step back from um, things that are as specific and, and well intended as um, you know what kind of assignments get made or you know the is it reading and writing or like I think that goes beyond um, you know where board policy should be and um, I think the next turn is to look specifically at this language under consideration with the proposals for K to five and see if it met both um, the, you know, the purpose of doing the audit of the policy, which was to look at best practices, to look at um, our current practices and consider the input from the teachers and professional staff and, and you know, what 
um, we think will help support the quality academic outcomes and also reflect kind of the culture and um, community that we, we have here. And uh, you see if this is policy guidance that we can move forward so that um, it, it becomes more broadly implemented. I think there are some really positive changes um, with a maintenance on a set of expectations, but also some needed flexibility that the board had recognized with some of the very specific language. Um, I think the research and the conversation has also been beneficial to put it in context and understand the like how and why and how we got to this point. Um, so here at 930, I would suggest we try to wrap up the discussion and try to figure out how to move this forward with much appreciation for the work that has gone in to considering you know, what's been going on and, and what would be best to move forward with. We have some questions. Yes. And can I ask a quick question? I haven't really spoken up. Um, so Dr. Jabari spoke about the, you know, the, and, I, and I think uh, Latanya, you mentioned you know, the flexibility to tailor the homework to individual students. And I just wondered about the teacher feedback on that. Yeah, yeah, uh, how often do they, I mean, what is their thoughts on individual, you know, variation in individual student ability to do homework? Yeah, um, they're, listen, don't let me mischaracterize it. They were not clamoring to assign each individual different homework. What they were looking for was just the okay that it's okay to send home this reading group gets this homework and that reading group gets this homework this week. It's going to be a little different and I don't have to worry that like somebody's going to say, well, why isn't my kid doing what my neighbor's kid is doing? Um, so it's just the flexibility to really consider that as they are assigning homework. I would still expect the vast majority of homework to be about where the class is and class assignments. But this allows them that chance to differentiate, which is something they do all the time. They differentiate all the time. They don't necessarily differentiate homework all the time. You still want to. So you have some questions yes. to take back to, to folks. Um, mm -hmm. So Ms. Weidman, perhaps what we could do is see, you know, the responses that are from the questions. If that dramatically changes anything that is here, then we would come back here. If it doesn't dramatically change, then I would say the next conversation would be in the policy committee but we can let you know, let you know that. Okay, and as always, if board members have questions about what was mm -hmm. presented, those can come in and inform next steps. And as always, members of the community who are um, watching this and want to react or respond, um, welcome that, that input. And when it goes to policy, it will have a policy committee discussion mm -hmm. and then um, first and second reading before being before adopted so the there board. are lots of, of additional times for input but clearly this has um, gotten some really important uh, context and and contributions from uh, the, the mm -hmm. building leadership and teachers I, I love that students were surveyed and, and they got their reactions too so yeah thank you for um, the thoughtful approach to this and uh, the, the way that the policy was adapted and proposed to to be a good place to move forward all right so there was a couple of information items oh, or no actually, information no, items there but there are, was nothing there are no there. information items that's okay. the information item yes. um, so there is time for public comment if there is anybody who wishes to speak Uh, hi, good evening. Um, Sarah Johnson, I'm a resident. Um, I wasn't planning on speaking, but I did, as you were talking, um, I did have one question. It's about the research behind like the summer slump. Um, Cause I know that's, I think that's a kind of a missed opportunity to get some gains. And I know you were talking about how like the students, if they have a specific goal or they can see improvement, um, they're motivated. So I'm just wondering like, obviously teachers it's hard to give them individualized homework on a daily basis but maybe by the end of the year the teachers really know the students they know like what type of things they like to do how they like to engage so i just think for parents and guardians and for students that would be really helpful just to give like really targeted like maybe your kid is exceeding in la in ela and you know they've fallen they're not as proficient in math 
So like maybe, you know, you just really kind of get the buy-in and explain to the parents and guardians and the students like, hey, if you do math facts for five minutes a day for three months, like, you know, that really gives kids the opportunity to, to maybe catch up and, and make those gains over the summer. Because I mean, it's, it's three months <laughs> and there's so much summer slump. And I, I mean, I know there's teachers here and principals tonight and I'm sure they know that in the beginning of the year, it's just, it's a lot of catch up and just trying to assess where the students are. And I just, I, I really think that at the end of the year, if parents were given, or parents and guardians and students were given something specific, for very specific for that child. So each child would have a different recommendation based on, you know, what their needs are. And, and also just the teachers would know like, oh, this child really likes to do games or this child likes to write, you know, and they could kind of tailor it. I think a lot of, I think a lot of students and a lot of, you know, parents, guardians would, would really like seize that opportunity. Cause I mean, really five minutes a day of math facts could really change the game for a lot of kids you know, if they're falling behind a mouse. So I'm just wondering if there is any research or if the district has ever thought about that, um, just really focusing on summer for kind of extra work. Because I feel like years ago, it was like libraries were involved with that. You know, I think there was like more engagement over the summer and more opportunities. So that's, that's it. But thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. We do send home summer, just as you're uh, getting seated, we do send home uh, summer reading, summer math activities. They've all been largely just choice though. They have not been, and we think it would be good for you to do this. So that's another thing to consider. I can talk to the teachers about, you know, how feasible that is and how we might structure something like that. Even including um, that there is a summer expectation as part of the policy. That's, I mean, homework, um, we, you know, we've been focusing on the school year, but, um, maybe look at having the expectation for continued learning opportunities over the summer. Um, I'll t make this really quick. My name is Sarah McCafferty. I'm a resident of the township. Um, and in listening to the conversation tonight, I just wanted to bring up two things that I thought were kind of missing um, that relate to the social emotional wellness goal. Um, and that's in looking at all the research that you did on homework. I also think there's a value in looking at the research on play and um, there's a lot of benefits for students' physical and mental health um, to have free, unstructured playtime, even in the middle school years and probably high school too. Um, so I think incorporating research on that in the discussion would be really important. Um, and then also in the case against homework, um, I thought one of the points should have been additional screen time because our kids, especially in the older grades, have are using computers very frequently during the day. Um, they're, they often have their own devices. They're on screens for sometimes 10 hours a day already. And so adding an additional two hours of homework, which is often done on screens, I think should be a consideration as well because we know the effects of that on students' mental health. So thank you. Thank you thank for you. raising that. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? Seeing none, we are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.